Hey everybody, welcome to the New Fly Fisher Facebook and YouTube live event. Thanks for joining us. Um, we've got a great show tonight with John Garrett, but before I uh, get started here, I just want to talk to you about a few things uh, quickly off the top. A lot of people uh, since last weekend or last week's uh, show were asking us where else we shot uh, the show this season and obviously, you know, the A team got out there and did the best they, they could under the uh, conditions of the pandemic, but this past season, uh, we shot Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Labrador, Newfoundland, Bahamas, and of course here in my beloved province of Ontario, especially up in Northern Ontario, lots of great locations. The other thing I wanted to tell you about right off the top is we've got some great guests coming over the next uh, month or so leading right up to Christmas. We've got April Volke coming on the show. We've got Tom Rosenbauer, Phil Rowley, uh, we've got Marshall Clutchen from Midcurrent, Tim Flagler, the famous fly tire, and a whole bunch uh, of other people coming on that I know you're going to love the interviews and lots of great topics. So let's get this thing going. Ooh, that's a nice size fish. I will catch these all day. That is what you're in for on this episode. So welcome again, everybody, and to my uh, friends and family down in the United States. Uh, here we are on the eve of Thanksgiving. Uh, I hope you all are going to have a great holiday. Tonight, we have John Garrett. I'm going to welcome him into the studio here. Hey, John. How are you? How are things in beautiful Colorado? Oh, they're pretty good right now. Uh, I heard you got some snow like we did. Got some snow, which, yeah. we, were, which we were happy to see because it put out the forest fires. That's true. That's a benefit of snow. I guess the only bad thing is sometimes the snow uh, actually can actually be like a blanket and it'll burn inside the uh, the earth. It'll, the it'll burn. Stuff. Yeah, it'll burn down in the pine duff and pop back up later. So, uh, John, I thought the first thing, uh, you know, a lot of people that are here watching right now uh, who are big fans, they're, they know your, know you from your books, of course. But uh, what I thought I'd do is start off by talking about how we met. Um, I actually did meet you briefly years and years ago at the Somerset show, but you were being swarmed at the time and somebody introduced me to you and met you briefly. But where I really you know, met you for the first time we had a chance to chat was in Labrador at Three yep. Rivers Lodge. Yep. Uh, that was two years ago. And I was actually with Tom Rosenbauer. We were there to make a show. I didn't know you were gonna be there. So I was uh, pleasantly surprised because going way, way back when I first started getting into fly fishing and my interest started to be piqued uh, about fly fishing, you were one of the first authors I started to read. So, um, you know, it's amazing that over that 1993, I started to get into fly fishing. Uh -huh. And it, here I am now having the opportunity to meet you and, and talk to you in this interview. So I'm, I'm really pleased to have you on our show tonight. Well, it's good to be here. Well, thank you. And, and so, Lots to talk about. Uh, I think the first thing we should talk about is your new book. And I'm going to put it up for everyone. And, and I want to say hi to everyone that's uh, joined us. Uh, there are lots of comments here. Uh, hopefully you can see them, John. And what we'll do is we'll do some, uh, we'll do take some questions here in the future. But first, let's talk about your new book, which just came out this spring. And, and what I'm going to do, if you bear with me there, John, it, uh, there we go. I'm going to pop it up here. Dumb luck and the kindness of strangers. There it is. So it came out this spring, and obviously it's selling well because it's already in its second printing. And uh, let me, let me, for the sake of everyone out there, John, let me read some of the things that have been written about it. Uh, this is from Forbes magazine. After five decades, 20 books, and countless columns, John Garrett is still a master. Uh, Publishers Weekly wrote, no, uh, excuse me, it's uh, the Houston Chronicle, America's Best Fishing Writer. There's a whole bunch of these here. I could go on and on, but I guess the key yeah, no, is- please, please keep going. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess the key is, John, why don't you talk to us about this book? I mean, this is, is this your 20th book? I know you've got like 20 out now, don't you? 
Yeah, I think it's 20 or 21. I lose track. Um, well, it you know, it's hard to describe your own book. It's, uh, it's essays on fishing. It's part travel writing, part sports writing, part personal essay, part memoir. It's kind of all over the place. Um, not always entirely serious. Um, someone told me once I wrote about fishing the way Jim Harrison used to write about food, which is that, yes, there's cooking and eating in there, but there's a lot of other stuff, too. So is that talking, you're, you're talking, you've got the body of a theme for a story or a thread, but you're going off on little side tangents. Uh, sometimes not so little, but yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> My wife is always accusing me of doing, trying to tell a joke, and I seem to go off on all these other tangents in the joke, which she says ruins the joke. But anyways, uh, but that makes for me a really good story. Who doesn't love a good story sitting around with your friends at a fishing camp telling stories of great fishing trips they've been on or great things. And basically this is a bit of what you're weaving through your story, right? Yeah, big time. Um, the one thing that surprises me is how, cause you know, I wrote this before the coronavirus and all of a sudden it seems really nostalgic because it, it, you know, it comes from a time when you could just go down and get on an airplane and stay in a hotel and be in crowds and, you know, so it's it, it's kind of nostalgic, almost seems like the old days now. And it wasn't that long ago. No, you're right. You're right. Before security became a hassle and all these other things, right? Yeah. You well, know, I, haven't, I haven't been on a plane, so I couldn't tell you what security's like. You it wasn't much fun before. Change, you mean, with the uh, yeah. pandemic? Say that again. Uh, you mean since the pandemic began, you haven't been on a plane? Nope, I haven't. Well, I can tell you I was on one, and uh, there's not a lot of people. The airport's pretty empty, and because uh, I flew out to, to, to uh, Newfoundland, and there wasn't a lot of people at the airports, and we were all spaced out in the seating. Now, that was back in July. I think things have changed a bit since then, and there's a lot more people flying. And obviously, with Thanksgiving mm -hmm. holiday, I understand a lot of people were, were flying uh, – this uh, last 24 hours and probably tomorrow too, but uh, it's still different travel than it was. That's for yeah. sure. But um, I know the book must be doing well because in anticipation of, of uh, this interview, I tried to buy a copy and I couldn't get it. In fact, I, had a, I went to my daughter and she's ordered it on Amazon because I couldn't even get it from any of the publishers here where I am because it's selling so well. So congratulations. That's, that's, yeah, uh, thank that's, you. Well, that's a great thing. And, um, you know, while we're talking about your book, why don't we take a moment? Because, you know, the, I, I like to go into some of the books that got me into fly fishing, which, of course, you wrote. I mean, the first book, I got to be honest with you, the first book that uh, I read was The River Y. A friend of my wife gave it to me. I was uh, in the military and I was deployed and she sent it to me. And it kind of piqued my interest in fly fishing. Then I got uh, this book, Trout Bum. Mm-hmm. And then I got this book. Oh, went the wrong way. Which actually, I really like this book. And then, of course, that book. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm going through your litany of books just to let you know how much money I've spent on you, John. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. And this one's a really good one. And this, this was a great book. Uh, I can't. I've got a couple that I can't find, which is usually code for I lent them to somebody and they did not give them back. And we're all, yep. we all know that, but I probably have a few books in my library that somebody gave me. And this is when I went hardcore hardcover book. Yeah. Um, actually one of your books that I really, really like, John, and it's something that's very near and dear to my heart, small stream fly fishing. Mm -hmm. And um, here I put that book up this one. I don't know if anybody out there has read this book. Fantastic read. And uh, I know you're a big fan of cane rods, but three weight, four weights, like a five weight's just too big. But going on these small streams and rivers, and you've got a lot of them out there in Colorado, but 
We have a lot of them here. They're all over the United States and and, yeah. Canada, and we're really blessed. What can you talk about this book for a second, if you don't mind? Well, um, it was uh, it's kind of it's kind of a how to book. It's not really essays. Uh, it's pretty it's a pretty straight how to fish book. Um, and the cover, notwithstanding, with the the uh, covered bridge and all that. Uh, it's mostly based on what I was doing out here in the West. So it's mostly mountain streams, beaver ponds, stuff like that. And, um, you know, in terms of, I looked at it a while ago, they were, they were going into a, another printing on it. Been in print a long time. Um, and I looked at it to see if I it needed to be updated and the only thing that's really out of date is the flies because they're all everybody's using different flies now but other than that uh, it all kind of still applies um there isn't that much new in fishing tactics people yell at me for saying that but but there isn't <laughs> no, that's true the fly patterns do change and i think you're right a lot of the techniques and uh, sometimes somebody will come out with a new technique but the reality is it's just a, a revision of an old technique but that you know you could say that about fly patterns too they're all big something you know they're all related to something right yeah um but i will tell you that i think one of the reasons why this book continues to be so popular john has to do with what we experience even in the fly fishing uh media world and that is that when i put up anything about small streams on youtube huge numbers of yeah people watch it it's just something, and I think it's that secret garden thing, you know? It's such yeah. a personal experience when you can go fishing on a small stream. I mean, you you can speak to this much more eloquently uh, than I can, but, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why it's so popular. Yeah, it is, and the thing is, they're everywhere. Any place there's trout rivers, there's going to be tributaries, and uh, we've been joined by my cat. That's what all is. Oh, I thought it was one. I thought you were waving a fan there. It must have been the cat's tail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she likes to she likes to come down and sit in my lap when I'm in the office. Um yeah, it's um and it's one of the places a lot of our streams out here in the West are pretty crowded, but if you get into the the uh, small streams, a lot of times you can find a, a nice big chunk of water to yourself and Nobody's out there, and there's a lot of them to choose from. And I don't know. It's just, and you know, that you're not going to probably catch huge fish. Although I've been surprised a few times, but uh, generally you're not going to catch big fish. But it's it's beautiful stuff, and you're out there by yourself, and um, it's pretty compelling. Very. It's how, it's how I started fly fishing. Is on little creeks. You know, something that's how I got into it, even though I was, I think, 32 or 33 at the time, when uh, some of my friends got me into fly fishing, that's where they took me first. It wasn't the big rivers. It was yeah. small little creeks catching little four inch to 10 inch brook trout. And it was, it blew me away. It blew me away how much. And I remember because that first time I went, it was like somebody at Disney had choreographed the whole thing because I had a, a deer walk by me. Didn't even hear me, you know, standing there and there's some willows casting. And then yeah. a beaver swim by. It was like the full fantasy. Not to mention the fact that brook trout were like little jewels, every one of them. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, it's wonderful stuff. And um, I just never got over it. I've talked to people who've gone to Alaska and Labrador and and just said, well, now I'm, I'm ruined for these little creeks. But that, that never happened to me. I, would be I can I can come back from Alaska and and uh, from you know catching king salmon and come home and take a day or two off to do laundry and um, go up to a little creek and catch six inch brook trout happily. I'm the same, and uh, it's not all about the size or the size of the river or being somewhere remote. Uh, and I've been doing this show 20 years now, and I can tell you, I still feel exactly the same way. So um, I think what we'll do now, somebody asked a question, to go back to your book. They asked me, or they were asking, where was this, where's this cover uh, been done? Like, what is this scene? Well, it's a 
it's a detail from a larger painting by um, Bob White, my, my friend Bob White, who I write about in the book, by the way. He's a painter, been around for forever. And it's in the um, Minnesota Driftless country. And um, it's just a little stream on a farm in the Driftless. And, um, you know, I love the cover. I'm really glad it's there. Um, Bob's done a couple of my covers now. And it's it's always a little disappointing because the, the, the whole painting, without all the writing and everything, is much nicer to look at. You know what I mean? Yeah. So... So I'm I'm really happy to have that cover, but I also have a, a print of the painting itself, and it's uh, it's much better to look at. It, there's much more in the background. It's uh, I'm not as big in the composition, and but yeah, Bob does does great work. He's been he's actually been illustrating my column for God, going on thirty years now. Wow, wow. And, um, 20 some years in uh, at uh, Fly Rod and Reel and now at Trout Magazine. Fantastic. Uh, another question, uh, if you don't mind there, John, Aaron Miller asked, uh, do you keep a detailed log of each fishing trip to remember that trip? And if so, could you describe how and what you use it for? <laughs> well, you know, I used to keep a fishing log uh, I'd make an entry every time I went out, and now I, um, I don't know, I didn't have the discipline for that, and a lot of, a lot of trips, nothing um, particularly interesting happens. I, t I keep a, a, a notebook on every trip I take of any length, uh -huh. and I just, I take notes, but it's not... Um, I just write down things like what what's what was the guide's name? What's the name of the river? What was the name of that tributary? You know, all stuff that you're going to need later and it's going to be really hard to look up. You can do it. But and and things like you know, like what's the correct spelling of Chiganagak volcano or the Agulawak River and things like that. You you can find out on site cuz they're going to have maps. Mm -hmm. Or somebody will know. Yeah, but it's not easy to look up online. So I, you know, and just anything, anything that, oh, especially things people say. I like to get quotes right, and um, just anything that seems interesting at the time. Um, most of it doesn't get used in the story, but a lot of it does, and I. Uh, I keep them. I have piles and piles of them here on the desk. I, uh, I keep them forever. I do like to come home, though. <clears throat> excuse me. I do like to come home. And within a day or two, I like to transcribe those notes on the computer. Mm -hmm. Because I find, you know, a lot of them are taken on airplanes or in moving boats or whatever, standing under a tree. And if I wait too long, I can't read them anymore. So I have to I have to transpose them pretty quickly. Well, I'd be interested to read your notes about when you were in Labrador with me. Uh, I could I'm sure to be start off with uh, something like met media mogul slash legend in his own mind who thinks he knows everything and uh, seen him casting on the water knows nothing. I now know why he calls it the new flag fisher. Yeah, well, you know, you shouldn't talk about Tom Rosenbauer like that. <laughs> <laughs> I sure hope he's watching. I doubt it. He never will. I'll have to tell him to, to, to play this later. Um, somebody asked here, uh, Sipping Rises, uh, if you were beginning to write fishing essays these days, what platform would you try to put it out on since print has mostly gone away? More importantly, how would you get it out there, John? I mean, it's a whole new world since you started. Yeah, it is, and I'm not sure I'm part of it. Um, I would argue that print has gone away. I don't think print has gone away. Um, I mean, I just published a book, and I'm I'm under contract to publish another one. 
So it's in print still here, and there's magazines. Um, but I, you know, most of the stuff is electronic now, and I just have never. I don't. I don't have any experience with that. Um, you know, we could talk all night about how to write, but where you publish it is another matter. Um, yeah. The main reason I never got into the online stuff is most of them don't pay. And I, I need to, I mean, I do this full time for a living, so I need to get paid. So it's really as simple as that. Magazines still pay. Sometimes not much, but, but they do pay. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I know people are kind of making it online, but I'm not sure how they're doing it. Blogs are a tough thing. Uh, that's one of the more popular ways of doing it is through blogs and stuff like that. But it's a changed world. And it's very similar to what you know we've gone through from when I started the TV show 20 years ago to sure. where we are today. And and it's not just YouTube, it's you know, you think about the film festivals and everything. It's it's a, a there's a lot more competition in mm -hmm. for writers, there's a lot more competition in media producers, and but and there seems like it should be there's a lot more different ways to get it out there. The problem is the pie is splintered so much it's hard to get your voice heard um, very much like, you know, in my day and your day, how do you get to be that author that writes the book that the publisher is going to say, okay, we'll publish this. And then you got to run around and, and get the publicity to get people to pick it up, read it and give you the chance to become their writer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that was not that easy. Um, but but at least it was obvious how to do it and the you know the publishers knew how to do it and they would coach you and mostly you go on the road you go around and give readings book signings talk to people and do interviews and um done a lot of radio a little bit of tv um tv usually wants uh flashier types than fishing writers um, but but radio, I've done, been on public radio a lot, and you just I don't know you the, it's it's kind of like fishing. It's patience. Mm -hmm. um, if you're out there long enough, pretty soon the the blue wing olives start hatching. Well, I've got more questions, but I'll tell you what, we're going to hold off for a second because <laughs> um, I've got a, a couple of things I want to ask, and I want to go back yeah. to some of the library of books that you've. Uh, you've had done over the years, uh, which is, you know, 20 books is a lot, a lot of titles uh, to get published. And one thing I've never, um, I, I was thinking about here when we were talking about, you know, how do you break in? Can you, is there a book that you had published that was the defining moment for your career that got you kind of like over that hump of recognition, sales, getting Simon and & Schuster and, and, you know, just all the, what, what, what was the thing that clicked? I know for myself, I can tell you, John, that for my TV show is when we got on public television. Yeah. I was just a little Canadian fishing show, blah, blah, blah. But when I got on public television and we started to get into right across the U.S., you know, over 100 stations, it, it just blossomed, my show in early 2000s. Yeah. What was your, what was your moment? Your, your... Um, I think it was uh, Trout Bum in retrospect. Yeah. Although at the time... I didn't, it wasn't that obvious at the time, but, uh, there we go. There's true. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's been, I can't, I don't even know how many editions there have been of that, but I always, I always like that photo. Cause I like the dog. The dog thinks the guy's got food. <laughs> um, it just, it struck a chord and it was sort of, it was sort of, it had a counterculture edge to it. Um, you know, I didn't write it as a hippie exactly, but, you know, I wrote it in the 80s and, and I'd, I'd been a sort of a counterculture guy before that. Mm -hmm. And it was a little, it was a little off the rails in some ways. And it was definitely not, um, it was definitely not your, your tweed tweed coat and uh and bamboo rod guy so much and um it didn't it it did okay at first but um 
it just gets sort of stayed in print. Um, I think it's it was published in '86. So how many years is that? Um, and it's been in. Uh, there's a couple of foreign editions of it. It's been in three hardback editions. Here there was a fancy leather-bound collector's edition. I mean, it just it it's just it's been there forever now. And um, uh, I I think it you know and my my nickname is the Trout Bum. If I if I'd known I was going to be become known as the Trout Bum, I might have called the book something else. Well, you should have maybe uh, patented the name, right? I think a lot of of many actors have jumped on that title as well. Yeah, I, somebody told me that once, but I don't know if you can. I suppose you could patent it. You couldn't copyright it exactly, or maybe it's the other way around. Could have copyrighted it, but not patented it. But um, yeah, you just it's you know I was a I was a kid. It, it's not the kind of thing I I thought of. Yeah. Oh no, you know that that's. How can you tell that something like that's going to take off? And, and I will tell you that in the early 90s, this is one of the first books I did read. Um, I think the other one, because uh, I'm going to use this to segue into the next piece I want to talk about. And everyone that's asking questions, don't worry. We're going to come to your questions. We're going to try and get them all tonight. Um, <laughs> but was your book, Another Lousy Day in Paradise? And why that book really struck me was talking about Labrador, one of the uh -huh. places on this earth. I dearly love, I, you know, I really love out Idaho. I love Wyoming. I love Northern Ontario. Um, but I, there's something about Labrador, and it's got to do with the fact that we're talking about a place with 133,000 square miles that has a population of less than 30,000 people. There's more black bears in Labrador than there's people, and I'm okay yeah. with that. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's they're, they're generally better company. And um, <laughs> I, I think there's only – four roads, four paved roads in the whole, the whole territory. Yeah. Which is an, an interesting little tangent. Cause we both love these, John. I had to rent a car there once and they said, yeah, you can rent a car, blah, blah. I'm filling out the paperwork and it says you can't drive it on gravel roads. I go, well, you only have like 10 miles of paved road to go. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Was pointing right in the car. <laughs> yeah. When I, when I went the first time, I got um, I got a map of Labrador, and it had at the time there were there was one railroad spur and three roads, and the roads were de de uh, described as seasonal dirt. Seasonal dirt. <laughs> that sounds like a good title for a book. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it is. <laughs> oh well, you write that down. So, um, Labrador. One of the things that really struck me in your book, and I think you were at uh, Minipede when you wrote about your, your yeah. travel there. I remember you talking about, you know, everybody loves the, the notion of catching a four, five, six pound brook trout on a dry fly. But in your book, I think you talked about throwing out a mouse pattern and seeing that head come up and swallow that poor little mouse. Mm -hmm. And how, what a visual, like visually how exciting that is. And I know you can catch brown trout on mice. If the circumstances are right. And you can catch rainbows on them. But for, for whatever reasons, I've had a lot more success using mice with brook trout than I have on the other two species for some reason. What's your experience? I never fished them for, I've never fished mice for brook trout except in Labrador. Yeah. Um, well, they work in Northern Ontario. I've, I've tried them. I've actually caught... Uh, brook trout, believe it or not, in Pennsylvania and uh -huh. in upstate New York in mice patterns, but always kind of like on the edge of darkness type of thing or early morning. Yeah, yeah. I've caught rainbows, brown trout, caught bass, pike. Pike, if you're not careful, pike will just bite them off. Yep, it's true. Um, but I've never, I never tried them. I'll have to try it. Maybe tie some small ones. Well, uh, Mark was in uh, Idaho and they went out and they were throwing mice patterns and it was like in the middle of October and they were catching some nice brown trout. Middle of the day, small streams, and he did really, really well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to use this opportunity to give everybody a little video 
Uh, unfortunately, John, it's not you and it's not me. It's actually Tom. Uh, but it's kind of like the best of. So when we were at Three Rivers Lodge in Labrador, Tom and I uh, went, we flew out to one of the, the, the rivers they'll fly you out to. And uh, I guess it hadn't been fished that season. There's so many rivers there, as you know, it's a massive yeah. watershed. And they flew us to this river and we went down. And this, is, uh, this was the day where Tom, his biggest brook trout at that point was 15 inches. Mm -hmm. His third cast, he caught a seven pound brook trout. Yeah. So let me play this video. It's going to be about three minutes long. Um, I hope everybody, you enjoy this. I called it Mouse Attack. Uh, John, it always puts a smile on my face. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it, especially when they miss it and come back. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you'll also note, like, we, I didn't cut into that video. We had lots of where a lot of times they'll come up and slam down on the, the mouse, like they're trying to drown it, yep. then come back and eat it or sting it, yep. which is a very common thing that the brook trout will do, as well as uh, other trout. Um, I remember when that first played, I put it up on Facebook a few years ago for uh, Robin Reeve, who's the owner of Three Rivers, and uh, people were saying, why were you, you know, the colors, you know, must be September. And I think when I was there, that was like the first week of August. I think so. Yeah. They, they, but again, yeah. the colors come out early there, right? Because everything happens early in Labrador. Everything happens early. August is, you know, almost October, the way we think about it. Yeah, that's true. It's very true. 
So John, why don't we go to some questions here now? We've had a little video uh, uh, fly fishing porn. Uh, we've got lots of questions and uh, yeah, thanks for the comments about uh, the brook trout. And uh, Michael, no, it's not a commercial. Uh, it's just a promo for uh, fly fishing in Labrador. And I guess you could call it a commercial because I hopefully, I hope everyone that's watching this gets the opportunity to go to Labrador, Northern Ontario, Northern Quebec, any of those places that have got giant brook trout of that size. I love catching brook trout anywhere, but there's not too many places where you can get them of that epic size, which yeah. is really, you know, incredible. Um, and lots of people asking about the St. Bring. That asking, is the, asking what? Oh, they're saying, it says, give Doug P a big hug from the OB crew. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Jim Weatherwax. I know what that means. Okay. Um, let, let me go back to some of the questions here. Uh, John, have you ever come up to Great Falls, Montana and fished the, the Missouri? Uh, I fished the Missouri, uh, not out of Great Falls, um, but. Um, yeah, that's been quite a long time ago, but I, I fished in Missouri once, spent a couple of days up there floating. Nice fish. Where did you, did you fish out of Craig? Yeah. Had a yeah. dog in the boat. There was a, the, the guy I was fishing with had a dog who thought she had to bark from the minute you hooked a fish until you landed it. And it was really cute at first, and after a couple of days, you're starting to wonder if you can drown the dog and make it look like an accident, right? <laughs> it's one of those crazy little uh, cattle dogs. Uh, David Lemoyne asks if you've ever fished uh, New England or the Smokies. Uh, I've fished up in Maine. I've never fished the Smokies. I did fish down in East Tennessee in the Unicoi Mountains with uh, Jim Babb, who was then the editor of uh, Gray Sporting Journal. And that was, talk about brook trout, there's some, some gorgeous little brook trout in those little creeks up there. Although they're, a, they're sometimes a pretty good walk to find them. Uh, lots of great comments here, John, uh, from people saying how trout bum was a, a big changing point for them. Uh, like it was for me, because I was already kind of wobbling on the edge there. And when I read your book and that plus my friends just kind of tipped me over into to the dark side. Though I've got to tell you, uh, one of your books, which I haven't got here, which uh, is on my to buy list, because now I have fallen into the addiction. It's this one. Ah. Fishing Bamboo. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a common thread through a lot of your early books talking about your love of cane rods some of your friends that built cane rods for you and obviously a passion. And if I could say, uh, wow, you know, there's people who collect cars there's people who collect Ferraris. Uh, this would be the Ferraris of the fly fishing world. Uh, but wow. Yeah but, yeah. but compared to Ferraris, a lot cheaper. True. But I'm just in, in, in respect, you know, uh, if you, if you collect Porsches and you collect Ferraris, they're, they're both expensive, but one's a lot more money. Yeah. And with cane rods, it's the same thing. You can have Porsches, but you can also buy Ferraris, right? Yeah. Based on the builder and stuff like that. Now, this book, um, John, this is uh, is this very much like the small stream book where it's talking about the hows, the whys, where it started? You know, it's, 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 it's a bit of story, but it's also factual? Yeah. Well, yeah, it is factual, um, but it's a little more of a – it's just a little more of a whole look at what the whole bamboo rod thing is about. I was, uh, Nick Lyons uh, initially published that. And he had, I was thinking about writing a book about bamboo because people are always asking me, well, what's the deal about bamboo? And I thought, well, man, I could write a little book. It's not very long. I could write a little book and just kind of explain what it's about. And Nick Lyons got wind of it, and he said, uh, I might be interested in publishing that. And I said, well, you know, there aren't that many people who 
actually want to spend the money for a bamboo rod. And he said, this is what made Nick Lyons a genius. He said, no, but a lot of people will pay 20 bucks to see what the deal is. And so that's how that came about. It was just a, it was just a wild idea until Nick got a hold of it. Very cool. But there's, there's, you know, it explains a little bit about how they're made. Uh, a little about the history. Um, and it just goes on into, you know, why they cast a little differently than they do and how to care for them and all that stuff. It just, it, it answers all those initial questions people were always coming to me with about bamboo. And it was fun to write. It was fun to research because I actually, uh, uh, as often happens when you're writing about something, uh, I didn't know as much as I thought I did. So I, I did an awful lot of research. And, and, I, and in the course of which got to cast some really rare and beautiful rods, too. Oh, I bet you have. I bet you have. Um, I had the privilege of uh, many years ago when I first actually started, um, Bob Summers was on the Mirror Machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bob Summers, for those who don't know him, uh, is a famous cane rod builder from Traverse City in Michigan. And uh, I, he, he's on my, I, I, even a friend of mine who lives in Detroit has already got me all set up to order one of his rods. But uh, he was, and he was using an eight, nine weight cane rod casting for those Atlantic salmon, which mm -hmm. I remember when he handed it to me, I was like, holy crap. This thing is so heavy. Yeah, he had no problem with it. No, well, he didn't. And um, there's, you know, it, one of the ways bamboo is different than uh, than graphite is that the weight in in the power stroke, the weight, the extra weight of the rod, does half the work for you if you if your timing's right. So instead of thinking about waving this heavy stick in the air just think about pointing it back pointing it forward and letting it do the work yeah that's the hard part and that's just my personal story i got into using cane when i was in, in patagonia because one of the people on the trip had brought a bunch of cane rods and he let me use mm -hmm. them on a small stream yeah uh, not catching particularly big trout but i i just had to slow everything down and it, I, once I got the rhythm, yeah, it was such an, uh, a fun experience. And it was, I, I was amazed at how accurately I could cast to a spot with a grasshopper, say, against a bank where mm -hmm. I knew I'd be a brown trout sitting. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're wonderful things. And you, know, you absolutely don't need one. I mean, you can fish uh, graphite or fiberglass or anything else. But if you... You know, if they ring your chimes and you try them and you like them, um, look out because they will end up costing you some money. True. So Sebastian asks, uh, in some of your books, you have a hard time catching Atlantic salmon. Which mm -hmm. would you say is the hardest to catch, Atlantic salmon or steelhead? Well, all things being equal, I think Atlantic salmon are harder to catch than steelhead, but Sadly, the steelhead runs are in such poor shape now that they're pretty hard to find. Uh, if you can find them in any numbers, you can usually catch one or two, but uh, the runs have just been terrible lately. Yeah. Now, to be, if I can interrupt it, John, we should tell people who are not knowing this that steelhead, we're talking West Coast steelhead as opposed to Great Lakes steelhead. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because there's quite a difference, and you're talking about casting and swinging flies as opposed mm -hmm. to in the great lakes they, they do swing flies but they do a lot of nymphing for the yep. steel right but yep. you're right bc washington idaho oregon they're all having problems with the runs right yeah they are uh i'm i'm hearing that there's still um decent runs of steelhead in alaska no, that's good well hopefully there's a change i mean on a yeah. positive note, the Atlantic salmon uh, runs on the East Coast have been making some nice, steady, progressive increases, mm -hmm. especially since the Greenland Accord got signed and it's the, the shutdown of the commercial fishery has really dramatically improved the numbers. So hopefully something can be done 
Similarly, because my understanding of the biggest impacts for the steelhead, and I don't want to get into the whole topic, but is the commercial fishing for the salmon is impacting the steelhead because they're a bycatch. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately. So um, another good question that was asked, and, and just so you know, I, I, I find I, I've had more success with steelhead than I have with Atlantic salmon. Just, I think it's why I like Atlantic salmon. And we were talking about muskie before you and I offline, and that's something that you're doing now. And it's just, I find muskie are like Atlantic salmon. There's such a, when they're on, they're on, and when they're not, they're not. And boy, they're frustrating. But when they're on, oh. Yeah, yeah. Like well, second it's, arm. Yeah, it's, it's either way, once you catch one, at least a, at least a big one, a big hot one, um, then you're willing to wait a long time, make a lot of cast for the next time. Which is very similar to a Lennox sound. Yeah, exactly. Um, Wannabe Fabrication is asking, have you ever fished the East Coast? I think uh, when he says he's specifically asking about uh, relative to where you are, uh, John, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware. Uh, never fished in Maryland or Delaware. I did. I've been in Pennsylvania a couple of times. Um, and, um, and I've been, I've been up in Maine some in New Brunswick. Okay. You know, they're, they're just, there's a lot of places to fish. My tendency, however, unless I'm going to, unless I'm going to the, uh, up into Eastern Canada, my tendency is to go West to fish instead of East. I don't know what that is that a geography thing just because of where you are? Partly it's a geography thing, and partly it's because all the guys from the East Coast come out to Colorado and Wyoming and Montana to fish. So I figure I'll go farther west. Okay. <laughs> That's good reasoning. I've been going I've been going to uh, the Driftless in, in Minnesota a lot lately. That's that's really nice fishing. Yeah, we had an invite to do uh, the Driftless in uh, Wisconsin. And we're yeah. going to do a show there in the next year or two. Uh, we just, uh, we're really busy. And it, kind of like you, you got a full calendar and somewhere in there, you got to do the other stuff. So it's always right. tough to make choices. Um, really good question from Joseph. Is there any chance your entire catalog will end up on Audible beyond the ones that already exist on that platform? So uh, is your publisher planning to expand into the Audible side? Not that I know of, but uh, we've sold the um, the audio rights to uh, several books, and um, I don't know. Somebody might come along and want to buy the the whole catalog. Uh, Simon Schuster has uh, audio an audio division, but um, they've never come to me about it. So we've we hung on to the rights and and we've sold them elsewhere, but. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely a possibility. Okay. The trick is, the trick is finding. I I read uh, recorded two of my books early on, Trout Bum and uh, The View from Rat Lake, and uh, boy, that's a grueling exercise if you've ever tried to sit down in a studio and record a book. And l the last um, the last bunch they've had other other people uh, record them and. Um, Boy, you gotta find the right guy. I won't. I won't point any fingers, but I, you just you gotta find the right guy to do that. Yes, uh, I've got a little bit of experience, and it's not so much for uh, us doing audible, but just you're right. You have to have the right voiceover talent to understand the small nuances of where they need to, you know, punch the sound and hang yeah. something and all that to, to really emphasize what you're you know you've written. Yeah, and yeah. wanted to decide, right? Well, so it's got to be somebody who knows a, a little bit about fishing, so they can understand where you're being sarcastic and where you're being serious. Yeah, and uh, it's got to be someone who sort of speaks Midwestern American. You know what I mean? Somebody who knows what that middle that middle American voice sounds like, because it's just that's that's you know I was born in the Midwest and that's just how I speak and how I think. So it's got to be someone who understands that. So I guess doing it uh, with somebody from Jersey is just not going to be the same, right? Jersey is not going to get it. 
<laughs> oh, somebody says that you should be doing the remake of The Old Man in the Sea. That's that's a, a good compliment. I'm a Hemingway uh, fan myself. Yeah, I, I, it's not a book that needs to be remade. I think he's thinking about the movie. Oh, the movie. Yeah, I do yeah. The Old Man. Yeah. You, you bet. Got Typecasting, man. <laughs> Peter Lewis is asking, how are your knees? Well, they've been better, but, um, you know, they still carry me around. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I just turned 74, and my knees are also 74, and um, they just don't work as well as they used to. But I, I get around fine. I just, I just go a little slower. That's, that's the key. You still get around. Get a little slower. Listen, I'm paying the price for playing hockey. My knees. Oh, that. oh yeah. They they sing some nights, uh, especially when you get this cold, wet weather that yep. we get sometimes. So uh, when I'm when I'm your age, John, I'll be paying the price too. But uh, if I could say uh, after seeing you in Labrador, you seem pretty spry for a guy with knee problems. I don't know if it was the caffeine or the the, the thought of catching a big brook trout or an northern pike on your fly rod. You were, I, I think it's a combination of the two. <laughs> um, really good question from Robert uh, Nordek. He's got a special request. John, would you consider making a video? Uh, and the video, what he wants it to be, Fishing Bamboo with Mike Clark and N. Engel. He thinks it would be epic. I would consider it. Um, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna produce it or fund it. No. <laughs> Somebody else wanted to do the work. I'd I'd be in it. <laughs> well, that's a good idea, and it's nice that he uh, he wants maybe, you to, to maybe, put it together. Maybe he can, maybe he can be my sugar daddy. <laughs> so, uh, why don't we talk about some more of your books, John? Because uh, you've got some epic ones, and I was showing some of them. You know, another lousy day in paradise. You know, it's like I said, one of the ones that I really like. But this is a really great book too. Um, even Brook Trout Get the Blues. Can you talk about this title? Well, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, a literary allusion to uh, Tom Robbins' book, Even Cowgirls Get the Blues. And, it's a um, great book. Terrible movie, great book. It was a terrible movie, wasn't it? But it was a good book. Um, yeah, you got to watch out for that. Hey, that's like um, the River Y. River Y was a great book. Terrible movie. Oh, yeah. Have you ever talked to David James Duncan about that movie? No. Don't, unless you've got a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> a good idea gone wrong. wrong. Yeah. Um, I, You know, I'll be honest with you. I don't remember what all is in that book. Give me a hand. Okay, well, you know, uh, I think one of the things that got me was it's you're talking about how um, how it's a hard life for for book trout in the Rockies, and how you talk about how you travel around, you catch them, and again, you're using your sense of humor to talk about your experiences, where you're going, because remember, book trout are not native, right? Yeah. They're placed in a lot of you know everybody. They're, they're, they're very much an Eastern thing, right? They're Maine, Pennsylvania, yep. Ontario, Quebec, but they're not associated historically. It's sort of like in, in British Columbia, there's this place called Fortress Lake. It's out way out in the mountains and there's brook trout in there because somebody in the late thirties, just before World War II, decided it would be a good idea to put a bunch of them in a lake. So, they, But they, they were placed there, right? So in that book, and what I liked about it is that you talk about your experiences and you also put it to the seasons of the mm -hmm. times of the year. So I, I don't know it's one of the early books I read of yours that I really liked. And uh, that's why I brought it up that one. And also still life with Brook Trout. Yeah. Well, I, I have the same thing with Brook Trout that you do. And uh, I do remember saying in that book that, you know, we fished our we fished our trout out out here in um, kind of late 1800s, early 1900s. But by the late 1800s, we had fished out a lot of our waters, 
And they were shipping brook trout out here from back east from the hatcheries and planting them. And they're not native, but you know, in some parts of the West, they're the most common fish because they're all, they, they all ended up up in the small streams and tributaries where it's nice and cold and clean and they're very common. You can find them all over the place. Mm -hmm. And um, more recently, they've started killing some of them out to restock some of the native, um, native cutthroats. But, uh, you know, they don't, I mean, they've been here. Those brook trout have been in the West longer than my family's been on this continent. So, you know, at some point, I mean, are you still an introduced species? I guess technically you are, but, you know, you've been up there a long time and uh, you're wild fish. Yeah, I agree. There is a, that moment or time in time when suddenly with something that was introduced really can be, you, you might as well consider it native. It's yeah. over 50 years somewhere. It's established. And if they wanted to get rid of it, it'd be really difficult to get rid of. So, well, if if um, people people go on about native fish, but and I'm you know I'm one of them. I love the uh, the cutthroats, but if we only had native fish out here, we wouldn't have very many trout because um, a lot of the streams just won't streams that will support brown trout and and brook trout won't support cutthroats because they're not quite cold and clean enough. So we'd have a few trout streams and we'd have a lot of squawfish. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got all these introduced fish and it's nice to catch the native, but natives, but it's, it's nice to have a lot of fish too. Very true. And what, one thing I think that's important to point out, um, a lot of times there are places, like I mentioned, mentioned Fortress Lake, that lake had no fish in it. Like yeah. there no fish, the glaciers, when they moved the mountains and everything, the tectonic plates and everything moved up, there was no fish in that lake. And there's parts of the West and every state's got it where there were no cutthroat or no bull trout or whatever the species was. And the same could be said in Chile and Argentina where they introduced the German, Germans brought down trout. Again, mm -hmm. the same thing. They didn't displace something. There was nothing there, right? Yeah, uh, a lot of the mountain lakes in, uh, in Colorado never had fish in them. Because they, they were too high, there was there was physical barriers, waterfalls and stuff. The fish could never get up in there, so they were completely, I won't say sterile, because they were a lot of them were full of uh, bugs and shrimp and stuff, plenty of fish food, but they had no fish in them. Yeah, and I have no problem that uh, people want to stock fish in there, and most of the fish they stocked up there were cutthroats, honestly. Now. Uh Somebody, uh, Jeff Brooks, uh, brought up a very good point. Um, and I was kind of going to go there at the end, but we might as well do it right now. Um, it's great to hear you have a contract for another book. What, is, what have you got bouncing around in your head right now? Are you working on that new book? Have you got a theme? Have, have you you want to give us a little insight into what's coming? Well, um, yeah, I, I've, you know, most of the stuff I, 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 write and publish magazine stories, essays. And at some point I put them together and it's in some kind of order and make a book. And then I go back and rewrite a lot of it to, to make it into a, an, a, you know, like a continuous actual book instead of just a collection of random stories. And what's happened now is I was like, I was, sort of two thirds of the way through the book and then coronavirus came along. So I've got two thirds of it is all the old travel and, you know, Alaska, Labrador, stuff like that. And then all of a sudden uh, I'm, I'm quarantined to um, parts of two counties in Northern Colorado, which is not all bad, mm -hmm. but um but all of a sudden there's just not all that. It's like a, a trip, a trip to some new place is like having this luscious pile of fly tying materials that you can tie all kinds of cool flies out of. And when you're stuck around home on the stuff you've been fishing for 30 and 40 years, it's still fun, 
it's still fishing, but now you're sort of tying your flies out of uh, chicken feathers and some dog hair. Yeah, that's good. So, you know, it's it, it becomes a stretch. I mean, I'm, I'm essentially a travel writer, and when I can't travel, uh, things get a little desperate. So um, that's what I'm wrestling with right now is what's the intersection between those two. And like, do I, do I, do I come up on the coronavirus and then everything changes or I don't know. I have to figure it out. Got about two years to do it. So, well, I, I can tell you from our perspective, from a media perspective, uh, we're trying to ignore it. We, we, we think of it as a little blip on the radar. We're, we're shooting our shows, John, to be the way it was before and the way it will be after rather than yeah. this time period. So you won't see our shows with a mask on. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I feel like I kind of have to deal with what's right in front of me. And and actually, it's kind of, I mean, it's sort of interesting to, um, to be, I don't want to say stuck, but by necessity, fish around home. Uh, on places that I've known for a long time and, and I'm really familiar with. And, uh, you know, you, as a writer, you get to kind of go deep on some stuff like that, but you know, coronavirus is here. The, the, the whole thing is here. The, the quarantining and, and the masks and the hand sanitizer and all that. So, you, you know, I like to write about life and, and all the warts. Um, you know, as you know, in my books, it's, it's fishing doesn't taste take place in this in this other dimension where everything's perfect. It's like there's mortgages and money problems and marriages and jobs and all that stuff. So you have to fit your fishing to your life and your life to your fishing and see how that comes out. And uh, so I, I, that interests me. So. So there's that. I mean, you know, I like to write about what interests me. That's good. John, we're, uh, we've actually been on for an hour now. It's gone by very fast. Um, I think for the sake of the people who are following us right now, are you okay staying on for a little bit longer? I still have uh, half a drink here. Yeah, yeah. Is your cat okay to stay? Yeah, cat went to bed, I think. <laughs> she got bored. Okay. Well, listen, there's some other uh, questions that people have asked. And, and I think one of them uh, that is, uh, where is it? Uh, and yes, some people have asked if uh, I could get you on the show. And hopefully, John, we will be able to coordinate something in the future. Uh, somebody asked about muskie. And that he heard that you had been in Wisconsin fly fishing for muskie. And you and I... Um, have been talking about this. I actually put together a little video clip of Pike hitting flies. Cause I remember when we were in Labrador and there I was heading out with Tom, we we're going for book trout and I turned to you at breakfast and said, so John, what's on the agenda today? And you go, Pike, I'm going to catch those toothy critters. Yeah. And another day you said lake trout. So you like to mix up your, uh, your, your food groups here and do different things. And, and you know, cause where, where can you catch lake trout and, you know, under 10 feet of water, but in Labrador, right? Well, there's, there's a few places, but yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? You have to go far north for it. But I guess the yeah. key is um, you recently got into muskie fishing in the last few years, and I've been doing it for a few years myself. Why don't you uh, talk about your muskie fishing? Well, you know, Bob White, the, uh, the painter, the artist, started running this trip he called Musky Madness, where he'd... Uh, you get a, some fishermen and um, and a bunch of musky guides together and and uh, rent a, a little lodge somewhere up in uh, northern Wisconsin and and we go musky fishing for a few days and uh, I just thought I thought it'd be a hoot I mean I thought it was a stunt catching musky on a fly I thought well this 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 could make a good story you know it's It'll be, it'll be, you know, kind of like stunt fishing, like fly fishing for, for, um, 
uh, billfish or something like that. Mm -hmm. And went up and learned about it and just got hooked. You know how that is. You, you, you get hooked on things. And, and it's like, and I remember thinking, geez, do I really need another expensive habit? <laughs> but it, you can't, you're not in control of that. No. And uh, I got, I didn't get a very big one. I didn't get a real big one the first time. I caught one, maybe two, one for sure. And, um, but I was, you know, I was, I was cooked then. So I went back the next year and, and got a hog and uh, totally freaked out. And that's, so th that's it. I mean, I was just, I was sold. <laughs> They're amazing. Uh, yes, they're a tough addiction. I don't know if the addiction is the frustration, the challenge. I don't know, it, or just how many times you get that follow and that quarter chicken dinner we're throwing out there. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to follow that fly and then watching them melt off into the darkness, never to be seen again. Yeah, so I mean, there's just there's just something about also about going to these pretty placid rivers in Wisconsin. And um, and string it up at twelve weight with a fly the size of a squirrel. It's like, what am I doing? But once you once you catch the, a fish, you go, well, okay, there's that. It's these things eat ducks and muskrats, so of course, just matching the hatch. <laughs> and there's no such thing as a delicate presentation when you're musky fly fishing. <laughs> well, it's it's physically impossible anyway but you don't want it i mean they you know if they think something fell in the water and is struggling they're going to come over and eat it so you want the biggest wettest splash you can get absolutely absolutely um john jason mezzel asked a very good question and he says john wonder if there are any books on fly fishing that either turned you on to writing yourself or were significant uh, influences on your writing yeah, um, the big one was um, The Longest Silence by Tom McGuane, which is uh, arguably the best fish fishing book ever written, I think. Um, I still go... Got it right here. I still go back to it from time to time. This is, uh, this is a British edition of it. But, uh, and um, Craig Nova, the novelist Craig Nova has a little book called uh, Brook Trout in the Writing Life, which is pretty good. And it's, it's, it's one of those, it's a classic because it's a thin little book. I've probably read it 10 times now. And I just, I read it as slowly as possible because it's perfect because it's so short, but it's too damn short. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you, you you want it to last, but you understand that if it was longer, it wouldn't be as good as it is. But those are those are two right off the hand. And, and of course, Hemingway. Um, Hemingway stuff was full of fishing. And some of the best, there's a book, Nick Lyons edited a book called Hemingway on Fishing. And it's a, it's a big fat book. It's an anthology of just all the places that Hemingway mentioned fishing. And some of the best stuff was when he was between the wars and he was in Europe as a correspondent for the Toronto, was it the Toronto Star? Yeah. And um, God, he writes about some of the fishing they did. And it's 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 wonderful. It's wonderful stuff, and it's classic Hemingway, because you know he goes fishing, and you go, okay, I'm going to learn about grailing, and and all you learn about is the local wine. But it's it's wonderful, classic Hemingway. And it's really good stuff in there. And then later, some of it's about uh, saltwater down in Cuba, and but it's wonderful stuff. Yeah. What about uh, Robert Traver or uh, Harry Middleton, some of the writers like that? You know, Middleton, I've read Middleton. I like him. Not my favorite. Um, 
gets a little maudlin, a little, a little too sentimental for me, uh, which is just a personal thing and not it's not an objective judgment. Um, Traver, I uh, I've read a lot of, and I was really into him at first. He he comes off now a little dated, but you know that stuff was written a long time ago. But mm -hmm. I, st I still end up quoting him. He said, um, oh, he said, uh, it's funny how good a fisherman I get when the trout decide to commit suicide. Things <laughs> like that. I actually, um, I actually fished Frenchman's Pond. I was up there in the, in the UP fishing for uh, coaster brook trout, which is something you might look into. Um, yeah, I threw them up on the Nipigon. Yeah. And um, I ran into a, a relative of, of uh, Hemingway or um, uh, Travers, and he invited us over to the Frenchman's Pond, which I always kind of wondered if it was a fictional place. But we followed him down these sandy dirt tracks through the woods and mm -hmm. came to this beautiful cabin, and it's Frenchman's Pond, and it was it was. Travers cabin. Wow. And, uh, went out and caught a few little brook trout and had lunch and talked for a while and I took some photos. Very cool. And, yeah, it was wonderful. He had a he had a, a big ship's bell hanging on the uh, on the uh, roof of the cabin that he'd ring at five o'clock for cocktails. <laughs> How apropos. Yeah. Uh, just makes me wonder because I, me I remember his way of describing the size of some of the trout, the size of the oar paddle um, or the blade. I mean, and or I think you described him the size of a beagle. So uh -huh. remember that because I used to get really excited reading, thinking of a brown trout or a brook trout being that big. Yeah, long before I got the opportunity to fish for uh, fish that size. Um, I want to come back to one of your titles, which we're talking about great titles, Sex, Death, and Fly Fishing, as opposed to Sex, Death, and Taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the inspiration for this book, John, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, it was just the the, the, insp the, the, the sort of the title chapter um, was just, there was a, there was a spinnerfall around here. Mm -hmm. years ago the things have changed now it's uh, not as prolific as it used to be but not too many people knew about it and uh and we'd go up there and it was right at and a little after dark and a couple of us would go up there when it was on a few times a week a few nights a week um there's a red quill spinner fall and we catch some some nice fish mm-hmm and somehow i can't remember how it happened but somehow that phrase came out of that story and i remember i i vividly remember typing that phrase and going well there's your title well it's it's a great title and i think uh going my agent to, liked it i'm sorry john go ahead my agent liked it that's the important thing, isn't it? Sometimes. Yeah. Because um, your agent probably loved this book, and I think this was one of your uh, bigger selling books like Trout Bum, and that's uh, Standing in a River Waving a Stick, which a number yeah. of people in the comments have mentioned it was the first book they got from you uh, back in the day that came out. That, was, uh, that title came from uh, a Jim Harrison quote. I can't remember the novel. Might have been Dalva, but he was describing a guy fly fishing out west somewhere, and he looked up on the hillside and saw a couple of coyotes standing there watching him. And he said the coyotes were wondering what he was doing standing in a river waving the stick. <laughs> and I thought, perfect. That's that's exactly right. It's the best description of fly fishing I'd ever heard. Well, uh, in the West, uh, I think people are pretty accustomed to see, seeing people out there in a stream or river fly fishing. 
where I live here, where it's all spin fishing, fly mm -hmm. fishing are very rare. I've literally had people come with their kids and point at me out standing in a local river casting for smallmouth bass. Uh -huh. You just, and then making the cast and I don't think of nothing of it, but they're, it's a big deal. So it's a perfect title job. Perfect title. Good. Yeah. So let's go um, back to what I think the, the, the main subject is, and I'm really glad to hear you're already into your second printing, even though the book just came out this spring. Uh, and that is your new title, Dumb Luck and the Kindness of Strangers. Again, a wonderful title. Um, John, any last words you want to say about this book, about what the inspiration was? And especially I like the kindness of strangers, because I think you speak in your book about how when you first came to Colorado and were learning about the fly fishing in your area, mm -hmm. how people made such a difference. And if I could say, it's one of the things that when I first started getting into fly fishing that really impressed me was how I could be there catching nothing and somebody walked down the river who's watching me and cut their fly off and hand it to me and go, this is what they're eating. I couldn't well, I, I remember that. I was, you know, just a kid and there were, there, there really weren't the, well, there were no videotapes at all. It didn't exist. There were no websites that didn't exist. Um, classes were really rare and expensive fly fishing classes. So you just, you get a rod and some, and some Taiwanese cheap Taiwanese flies and you go out and start flailing around, and try to figure it out. And I just remember one old guy after another coming up to me and saying, excuse me, son, do you mind if I make a suggestion? And that's how I learned how to fly fish. So yeah, that kindness of strangers is really important. And you know, as as nasty as things have gotten lately, that's kind of still out there. You know, mm -hmm. you can go and I I try to do that. I try to pay that forward. And um, you can still approach people on the stream. You can still walk over. How are you doing? Doing any good? What are you using? And it's just. I don't know, and people who probably wouldn't agree with you on anything else, but they can stop and agree on fly fishing. Kind of nice. Yeah, I, I, that, that really says volumes about what I like about fishing and fly fishing in particular is, is how it can be so neutral. You know, that old rule when you're at a lodge, you're sitting there with a bunch of people at, at the table, you don't talk about religion you don't talk about politics and we all have the common ground of the fish yeah yep. the environment the weather what fly is working everything and that's what i really enjoy we put everything to the side and people the goodness in them seems to come out so your title is just perfect yeah well thank you well john uh we've had other comments unfortunately everyone i'm sorry i can't get them all in uh it's already well past our time. And uh, I've really enjoyed having you uh, on our show, John. Uh, I'm hoping in the future, we, you'd be willing to come on again uh, to talk yeah. about other topics. Uh, yeah, well, I, what I'm, I'll be happy to do that. What I'm hoping is that we can meet somewhere and fish. Well, that would be the fantasy. I'd love to take you for some big musky pike, uh, brook trout again. And, and, and uh, we should tell people I had to go to Denver couple of years ago uh, to go to a meeting with uh, with the one network we were dealing with and we were supposed to get together but unfortunately the I was gonna come up to your place and the snowstorm hit and I couldn't even that's leave. right I forgot about that yeah I think it was yeah. two years ago and it was like in September too it wasn't like it was October November it was September yeah we get some monsters in September sometimes well uh, I do agree and I I I'm going to end this as we go into the American Thanksgiving uh, by saying I am full of optimism for the future. I believe the next year is going to be fantastic. There's lots of positives happening besides uh, the uh, vaccines that are coming out. There's rapid testing. I believe Canada is going to open up. I believe we're all the world's going to get to a new normal, but and there'll be still protocols, there'll be concerns, but we're both going to be able to get together, John, and we're all, uh, everyone that's watching this, 
we're all going to get a chance to go to the places we want to go and do the destinations we want to do. Um, I, I, I think we're getting out of the dark period. We're, we're I'm, seeing the light. Or as I'm, Winston, I'm counting on it. Yeah, and I think Winston Churchill said it so well in his memoirs, The Beginning of the End. Mm -hmm. so, on that note, uh, John, happy Thanksgiving. Thank yeah, you for being on the show. And everyone, I strongly recommend, if you haven't already put this on your Dubai list, buy Dumb Luck and The Kindness of Strangers. Um, I'm not saying that because I read the book. It's just I haven't read a bad book by John. I, I've never had a book. I went, what was John on when he, when he wrote this? Every one of your books just resounds so well in my heart and in my mind, and they just fortify my soul. And I know this one will do the same. I look forward to opening it up on Christmas Day and reading it this winter. John, happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for being on the show. You're welcome. Happy to be here. And everyone in the USA, thanks for watching and happy Thanksgiving. Take care.